Our next unit's going to be on the Age of Exploration. Uh, we're going to be able to kind of go country by country is, is, is how we're going to approach this unit uh, as we kind of go and see how the European countries have uh, dipped their toes into the <laughs> literal oceans uh, going around the world. Uh, we'll see how they've managed the new colonial empires that they're going building, as well as how they've exploited the peoples, the environment, um, as they're going out and exploring the rest of the world. Uh, first video today, we want to kind of build up the uh, an, an introduction into the Age of Exploration, kind of give a unit overview, and then get into our first uh, major explorer from this age, uh, a Chinese explorer, uh, if you can believe it or not. So the Age of Exploration is where the eyes of the Renaissance are going to go and turn outwards. And what we can see here is that there's going to be causes, and as you probably can imagine, effects of this Age of Exploration. And when we talk about causes, we can talk about the reasons for the Age of Exploration happening when it does in terms of crowns and of crosses. Uh, kings, monarchs are searching for wealth and spices to be able to go and, and try to drive uh, up their wealth. Uh, in terms of Christianity, we saw in the end of the Age of Reformation, people are trying to spread their Christianity. And remember, they're also trying to spread their version of Christianity, which is going to be another major driver as a lot of these different kingdoms begin to identify as Catholic, as Protestant, and remember, in the zero-sum game of Christianity, if you are not one of us, then you are one of them, and therefore that is bad. And Jesus is not returning for a thousand years of peace and prosperity until everybody is the, quote, right type of Christian, end quote. So that's what they're trying to do. With that Christianity, they're also trying to kind of bring the world, civilize the world, civilize in a European model and not the, quote, civilizations, end quote, that these other peoples that the Europeans are meeting sometimes for the first time have. So the monarchs really are bringing, are looking for spices, gold, and labor to help increase the wealth of their countries uh, and the things that they can do and show their power on there. So those are, in a nutshell, are, are kind of the causes and the effects we'll see include an acceleration of progress progress in a big idea of a capital P, but this is obviously going to come at a price. So we'll see uh, the acceleration of progress in terms of innovation, learning, and commerce, but we'll also see the degradation and exploitation of land and labor, as well as slave labor, um, which is obviously not going to be that great. So we can see that with the age of progress, we're going to see lots of cool, awesome, virtuous things come out of it, but the, the vices of exploration are going to be things that we're still dealing with the outcomes and effects of to this day and, and, and aren't that great. So really, like always, we need everything here, here in yellow. So when we're talking about the age of exploration, we can kind of talk about the five G's of exploration. What are some of the causes? Are these words here? So gold, God, glory, greed, and grain. And you can see that grain is maybe not as big of a one. Um, but the, these others are the major drivers of that, to gain wealth, uh, to be able to go in and gain glory, uh, to do this in the name of God, but to also gain a lot of wealth and, again, help feed rising populations back in your home countries. We see, you can also see the Age of Exploration as building bridges to the New World. The Vikings are the ones who, the first Europeans to go from Europe all the way to the New World here. But importantly, the Vikings really didn't establish a way to continuously go back and forth. They stretched their toes out there. They, they made contact, but they were kind of left Newfoundland uh, before anything really major could happen. So whereas Columbus, 100%, and we want to be clear about this, did not discover a new world, Columbus is important for building the, quote, uh, bridge, end quote, to be able to bring Europeans back and more importantly, forth between these uh, old world and new world. So when we talk about the old world for this unit, we're talking about your Europe's, your Africa's, your Asia's. And when we talk about the, quote, the new world, we're talking about your North America, South America, Latin America's, the Caribbean. And Columbus is going to be the one to build that bridge, to be able to find out and, and establish a way to go back and forth between these two continents, really for the first time since the 
end of the ice age. And these are obviously going to have constructive and destructive forces and things and ideas go back and forth across this bridge. So we're going to see tools, vision, and the will. The tools to allow this to happen include new and improved maps, new instruments, and new ships. The vision is going to be provided with new different ideas and new leaders and new wealth to support these journeys. And then we're going to see a new breed of explorer, like a Columbus, like Magellan, who's willing to, in essence, go off into the unknown right, for all these different reasons to go and do that for them. So out of the Renaissance, what we'll see here is, again, uh, we've seen a Reformation, we've seen expansion, and then we'll get into Enlightenment. So if we're kind of ticking these off, we've done the Reformation, we've done the, we're doing the Age of Expansion now, and we'll see how in our next unit after this, an Age of Enlightenment that all stems from the Renaissance. So this is an expansion and commercial revolution. The question, why, how does this happen? Well, trade with the East is going to lead to more curiosity about the Far East. That curiosity is going to find people who aren't Christian, which is going to lead to missions right, out there. Those missions need support, right? So we begin to build colonial empires to be able to protect those missionaries. And then you need to be able to, well, we'll see scientific progress come out of those colonial empires to smooth, quicken it, and make those voyages more efficient. Technology is going to be the key that drives this. So we'll talk about new new technologies like cannons, astrolabe, galleys, latine sails, compasses, and caravels to help drive a lot of this expansion and progress. The other thing that we'll get in toward, towards the end of this unit is how things change. And we can talk about five major ideas and products and things that are going to be moving from the new world to the old world or from the old world to the new world. Again, old world, we're talking about Europe, Africa, Asia. New world, we're talking about the Americas. So what are some effects on five different things? And are they going to be affecting the new world more? Or are they going to be affecting the old world more? So we're going to kind of blues clues this. So if we take a look at the horse, any ideas about where the horse is going to have its big effect? Is the horse going to have a bigger effect on the old world after this time period, or is it going to have a bigger effect on the new world? So we'll let you give your response. Nope, you're wrong. It's the new world. Right? The horse is going to be going to the new world and have a giant effect in there. When you think about your Cowboys and Indians movies from the 1950s and the Native Americans are attacking the, the circled pioneers in their wagons on horseback that's a new introduction of this animal the horses the native americans on the plains are using our horses escaped from spanish colonists and settlers in the new world uh, who have come to the new world and so these are animals that have been extinct on the north american continent since the ice age since the early paleo native americans came in and ate and murdered all of them uh, uh, so th that, that's what we see in there. So the Native Americans on the plains, your Comanche, your Sioux, uh, your um, Cheyenne, the, their world is completely upended with the introduction of the, the horse and their societies are relatively uh, still in a state of flux when Columbus has arrived, well, not just after Columbus has arrived there in 1492. The biggest domesticated animal prior to the horse's reintroduction from Canada in the north to Tierra del Fuego and Argentina in the south is a llama, and they can really only hold like 50 pounds at once. So the horse is a major game changer for the Native Americans. All right, where do we think the potato is going to have a bigger effect? Is the potato going to the old world? Is the potato going to the new world? You're right. The potato has a much bigger effect in the old world. Uh, if we think of what country is famous for its, it is cuisine for the use of potatoes, you think of Ireland probably. Uh, but potatoes come from Peru, the Andes Mountains that are there. The potatoes are being used by the Incans uh, for generations uh, b before they go and uh, they do that. Now, the potato is going to be a major player in the old world. Uh, well, it's going to become the major cuisine of the Irish after the English show up and, and conquer and enslave the Irish and basically only allow the Irish to grow potatoes because anything above ground is going to be sent back to England. The potato is going to have a huge effect on Central Europe when we get into things like the 16th 
early 1600s with the 30 years war in germany and you have these armies rampaging across central europe for 30 years anything that grows above ground is going to be stolen by these soldiers so luckily for some of these peasants to help them survive they're going to be able to grow potatoes underneath the ground to kind of go and hide those crops from marauders and brigands and armies your next crop is corn any ideas where you think corn is going to go no, right. It's going to go to the old world. So again, corn comes from Mexico, North America. Corn's in everything uh, today, but corn is going to have a big deal when it goes and moves out of North America and Central America back to the old world. Diseases, disease. Where do we think disease is going to have a bigger impact? Is it going to be going to the new world or to the old world? Nope, you're wrong. Diseases are going to have a giant impact on the new world. Remember, the Europeans, Africans, and the Asians are very much locked in step and are trading with each other. And when you're trading with other people, they're going and spreading diseases. North American, Central American, South American, the Caribbean Native Americans are much more spread out. They're not densely populated as what we see in Old World uh, societies so we're going to see less diseases and remember since the end of the ice age the new world has been cut off from the old world so while all these diseases are percolating and getting people sick in the old world the people in the new world do not have the immunity to fight these diseases off and as we'll talk about it's estimated between 90 to 99 percent of the population of the new world in 1491 within 100 years will be dead from diseases and which is going to cause a giant impact how is again if you take how is the united states successful in being able to go from coast to coast because when the first settlers in the present day united states arrive they are walking into a modern into a graveyard of native americans who are dying and their societies are being turned on their head from wave after wave of disease finally sugar is going to be a major player here and do we think we know where sugar is going to go you're right sugar is going to be going to the old world moving from the um uh the plantations that are going to be set up mostly in the caribbean and south america and be shipped in massive numbers back to the old world as we'll see where the europeans will have motives for discovery and colonization we'll see adventure mercantilism religious freedom unemployment political freedom and just plain old curiosity so last five six minutes here have just been kind of an overview of what we want to get uh, talk about and, and understand here in our age of exploration uh, as we kind of understand what are some of the major themes and ideas we'll be talking about in this unit so we want to switch gears here uh, from an introduction to the different explorers in different nations that are starting this. And the first nation, the first of our countries sending out explorers in the age of exploration is going to be China. From 1405 to 1433, Zheng Ha is going to lead several expeditions for China to go and explore the, the known world. Zheng Ha is a Muslim eunuch sent out by the Ming Emperor Changzu with the goal of promoting Chinese power as well as to collect tribute from other peoples. Now we know from our previous notes that we've taken that tribute is payment from a weaker power to a smaller power. And again, just the idea of the celestial kingdom of the Chinese to be able to kind of promote its power to see what else is out there and see if there's more lands for them to exert their influence on or to reap the benefits from. He's going to bring silk and goods. Zheng Ha is to trade, but really trade is a secondary goal of these missions. It's very much the idea of an extension of the Chinese power outwards over the seas from what they've already been able to do over land. In total, from about the 28-year period uh, of these expeditions, seven are going to be sent out. They're going to reach a, kind of in steps, and you'll see this on your Age of Exploration maps that you're doing for homework. Uh, they're going to be reaching Southeast Asia, India, Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, 
and East Africa. And these are all well documented, uh, not only by the Chinese, but the peoples who, there who are writing them down. Uh, kind of, we, we know all about these. For some historians, and again, this is where we, we start getting to the historiography and, and where the sources start to uh, conflict and, and disappear, is that some people believe that saying, huh, not only, we'll get the, the pen out, so if we have, sh- there's Africa, there's Saudi Arabia, and there's, sh- there's India, all right, then we get into, and there's China, all right? So not only is Zhang Ha getting over there, getting over to there, getting to there, down this way, but some people, will, some historians contend that he also went down over here, and that's the Atlantic Ocean. All right. So some think he went over there. There's even fewer historians that believe he went even farther, possibly into the Mediterranean or even up into, say, England. All right. And there's one historian uh, who contends that the Chinese also went eastward across the Pacific into there. Now, that is very flimsy evidence, uh, and that's really not part of the scientific consensus. But why I mention these at all is to get the idea of just how powerful, how large these expeditions are, and and just how um, well-documented these uh, these ones over here are uh, versus what's going on uh, that that way. So if we, these are the ones that we know for certain happen, well, to have these other rumors and, and other ideas contend just so just how powerful and well the ones that we do know happen. So that that's why I like to mention those, even though again not the best evidence uh, for any of the stuff here in white. Now, these are going to bring back spices, treasures, and animals to be displayed at the royal court. We're going to show you a picture of the unicorn brought from Africa to the Chinese emperor that he displayed in the forbidden uh, city uh, that he had. So, again, be on the lookout for the unicorn coming up here in a couple slides. Now, we talked about this with the question today. We should know that these expeditions are a big deal for a couple different reasons. The, the distance they traveled, the amount of men on the fleets, and the size of the ships that went out there, the sheer size of these expeditions. The Ming treasure ships put onto the sea by Zhang Ha and the Chinese are believed to be the largest wooden ships ever built in the history of the world. The largest ones measure 400 feet long and 150 feet wide if your average school bus is about 40 feet long, right? You're looking at, what is this, 100 school buses in length, right? Uh, and then again, uh, we're like, what, five, six, seven school buses lengthwise across and wide. These are giant ships, particularly when you start to compare the size of, let's say, Columbus or Magellan or uh, Champlain are going to be using uh 60 years, 100 years, 200 years later. The first expedition that's sent out is going to have 317 total ships. Remember, Columbus is sailing the ocean blue in 1492 with three. This is 317. 62 of them are the largest wooden ships ever built in the history of the world. It contains 255 support ships, and we're talking anywhere between 25,000 to 27,800 men. There's ships that just are for the horses that are being brought in this expedition. There are ships that just are carrying fresh water to be able to provide fresh water to the other ships that are out there. These are major giant expeditions that can only be mounted by a society as advanced as... um, well run as well financed by the Chinese. The Chinese would be would be really the only country in the world that could do that at this point in world history for for the next couple hundred years to be honest to do this. This is this is an amazing technical achievement, logistical achievement, and this is expedition number one. Now they're gonna get a little bit smaller as, as we continue on there, but we just want to emphasize the size and the distance and the 
the size of the ships, the amount of men on the sh uh, uh, in these expeditions, and how far they're traveling. So the obvious question that comes up every year then, why aren't we speaking Chinese in the United States today? Why aren't the Chinese going, if they're able to do this, what, 98 years, 80 something years, wait, yeah, 89 something, 89 years before Columbus, right? What's the deal here? Well, it's that, what do the Chinese find when they go out there? They find that there's nothing interesting, right? They're not curious about the world. They say, cool, there's unicorns, but what else do we have? All the other stuff that we see that we're finding, we already have in China. So why are we going to East Africa if we already have that stuff in there? It's the old uh, joke the freshman soccer players always bring up is, is, is that you're, when you're, can you ask your mom, can you go to McDonald's? And you say, hey, we've got food at home. Right? The Chinese saying, well, we've got animals at home. We don't need it. So the Chinese begin to say there's nothing out there for us. Everything we already need and want and could desire is already in China. So they begin to turn inwards and isolate themselves from the rest of the world. Whereas the Europeans who are in these backwater, dirty, small little towns and villages are have their eyes awakened and are wowed by the outside world and look outwards, the Chinese say, no, we're going to turn inwards. With the extension of the Great Grand Canal from Nanjing to Beijing, this is going to allow more merchants to be able to stay off the open seas in China, and that's going to further make it so that the Chinese are going to turn inwards towards China themselves. Within a couple generations, it's going to become illegal in China to own a boat with more than one mast, right? because if it has more than one mast, it's it is a vessel to leave China. Why would you ever want to leave China? And if the emperor finds out about your little vessel with two masts, he's going to send his goons to go smash it into bits and pieces to show you. So this is, again, kind of, we want to emphasize just how advanced these expeditions are. But in the same token, we want to, be able to say we can compare and contrast that Chinese expeditions are bigger, more funded, bigger, cooler stuff, travel more distances, and yet... The end result is a looking inwards, whereas the Europeans with smaller expeditions uh, with, with, that are not as well uh, kind of financed and funded, they come back with a newfound appreciation of the outside world and turn outwards. So a very interesting dichotomy in similar reasons, but different uh, returns from these expeditions. Well, that's Zheng Ha uh, as, as, on the voyages here. Uh, there's tales of him being seven feet tall and being this and that. He might just be a big dude. Uh, I guess someone who's six foot five is, is still pretty tall. Someone who's six two is pretty tall. Uh, so again, seven feet tall might be a stretch. Uh, but again, that's what we get from kind of the sources. Uh, but, but there's not a whole lot written about Zheng Ha himself. Uh, this is hopefully what your maps are looking like when we show that. We're again moving down from the southern capital of Nanjing working our way through the kind of Indonesia, the Malaysias, the Sumatras of the world, into India, uh, the Arabian Sea, up into the Red Sea, and then down into East Africa, right, or d down to, across the Horn. Uh, this is a model of one of the treasure ships that's in the Field Museum uh, in, in Chicago. Uh, so th it's hard to be able to have something like this, the scale, to be able to go and do that justice. But this gives a better idea. Now, the, the, the colors on this are off. These were said to have great red sails made of silk to be able to kind of do it. So some sources describe it looking like the horizon is on fire when these expeditions arrive off the coast because of all the red flags sailing in there. But this ship is Columbus's Santa Maria, which is his flagship for his first expedition in 1492. And so that's the biggest ship that he's able to go out with. And we can compare that to the one of the 62 that are sent out by uh, the Chinese. This is Vasco da Gama's ship in comparison. And again, you can kind of go and pick it up and bracket it. So you can do maybe three, four in, in length and maybe three, four in width as well. Just the, the, the size is what we want to go and emphasize. So you can see a Viking longboat. You can see... Uh, maybe uh, the Gama ship, 
and then just the tail tiny end of one of these giant mean treasure ships. In preparation for the 2008 Beijing Olympics, the Chinese built one of these boats, right, it, to kind of do that. They were unsure how exactly it was going to float and do that, so they had to build it on land. But um, this was something that in 2008, you definitely could go and walk around. Don't, don't quote me if it's still there or not today, but to give you just an, an, an idea of just how large and big these are. And remember, these expeditions are bringing back all sorts of cool things, like the unicorn that you see right here that was brought back to the uh, Beijing uh, and the emperor that's there. And, oh, Mr. Kramer, that's a giraffe. Well, yeah, they don't have a name for a giraffe in Chinese. So that's what they go and they come up with. And this particular giraffe is supposed to have lived for 20, 25 years in, uh, in under the emperor's kind of care. Now, the big idea here is that the Chinese are saying, cool, we've, we've got giraffes, but great, whatever. And there's nothing else that's out there. So where the Chinese will end with them here, go back, turn inwards. We'll see how in our next set of lectures with our Portuguese sailors, how they begin to see the wider world and turn outwards in their explorations and expeditions.